Well, hello, my name is Brad Burkhartsmeyer. I'm one of the instructors here at uh, Solar Energy Inter International. And I, uh, I've d done a lot of projects in the developing world. A lot of them have to do with water pumping, and some of them have to do with lighting, and some of them have to do with getting uh, computers into schools and those kind of things, communications system. Because people really uh, need to have some electricity in their life. Uh, one of the things the United Nations said in their millennial report was that people needed to have access to inexpensive energy in order to get out of poverty. And of course, they need the basics too. They need food and water and shelter and education. But in order for them to really advance, uh, they're saying we need to, everyone needs access to inexpensive energy sources. And so when we bring them uh, solar lighting systems or, you know, some kind of system where they, kids can start to learn to work on computers and stuff, that can change their lives. And so I really enjoy doing that kind of thing. Have you had an opportunity to return to some of the places where you've done renewable energy work to see how your work has impacted people's lives? Well, we've had a couple of cases where I worked with a project with the Solar Electric Light Fund in Benin, and they provided water, pumped water in a big tank that women were using to irrigate a field. And so each woman would get a row of this field that they could grow their own vegetables on. And so what they saw happen over a couple of years was now the women were growing two crops a year because they had irrigation water that would allow them to do that. And then they're taking that second crop and actually selling it in the bigger city in the market. Uh, and so what's happening as a result of having some water is that the women now have a source of income. And so they're bringing money into the village. And one of the problems when you're living in a very remote areas are not there's no money circulating around and so in this case it allowed there was a because of just a solar pumping water they can grow crops and get money coming in to their town and it's going to help everyone that money now is circulating around town and people are moving ahead well, on the topic of money, how are these <coughs> renewable energy uh, projects funded? Typically? I could only speak to the ones that I've worked on and the ones that I've helped develop with, with other colleagues here at SEI. Um, we've actually got funding from nonprofit organizations. In our case, some of the Rotary Clubs and some churches would provide funds. Um, some of the bigger projects that I've worked on with other organizations, funds have come from large uh, donors and so it is a lot of it is done by donating money most of the time uh, the equipment is purchased and our airfare is paid so that we can go and help people learn how to use it install it do a lot of training and I can talk more about training in a minute because I think it's key to it all but um, so the outside funds buys the equipment and our expertise uh, but we can't actually install that without a great amount of, whether it's financial or um, in-kind contributions by the local community. If we're installing a water tower, how does that water get from that tower to everybody's house? Well, the people where we're working, they're the ones that are digging those ditches and putting those pipes in. So often there's a tremendous amount of participation from the local folks as well. Do you find that the places where you're doing these projects have uh, some degree of technical understanding of what you're doing or is the training component a large bit of what's going on besides just putting in pieces of the puzzle? When I work in, on a project in a developing world community, we, I won't do it unless there's a large training component. In most of our projects, we probably spend more time training and teaching people than we do actually installing the, the solar panels and the lights or the solar panels and the pumps. Because what happens is we're coming from the outside and we're going to install this system and get it going and then we're gone. Right? And if, if the maintenance and the ongoing survivability or sustainability of that project is really totally dependent on that community. And so we have to work for, you know, sometimes it would be two weeks of training for a one-day installation. And so it's just that they have to become very comfortable with the, the equipment. They have to know what to test. They have to know, uh, is this some problem that came up that, that I have the skills to fix? Or is this problem with something that I, I can't fix, say the inverter went bad or something, that they can't fix it? 
And so when do they need to get outside help? So we're really trying to help them be able to make those decisions and fix things they can fix, maintain things so they keep running for a long time. And so training, uh, without training, I don't think these projects are even worth doing. Because then you're just plunking down some technology and it breaks and then what happens? You really haven't helped anybody. They're back to where they were before. What are the primary challenges that you face with a developing world project uh, from beginning to completion compared to what you'd find in places like Colorado or other parts of the uh, United States or developed world? Yeah, so if we're working in the United States or here in Colorado or something, it's very easy, you know, you just design a system, you can order this stuff, it'll come on a truck in a couple of days, you need to go get some nuts and bolts, you can go to the hardware store, it's really all those things that we just can do very simply here are often very, very difficult challenges in other parts of the world. Especially if you're working in areas that don't have electricity, where, where we are doing these projects most of the time, in very remote, isolated places. There's no hardware store. And so one of the challenges I remember from a job we were doing, we are, uh, the bolts we had that were sent with, you know, shipped overseas and everything were too short for our mid clamp. So we needed an inch and a half bolt, which would be something very easy. I could just run down to the hardware store here and grab it. Pretty much any hardware store I could do that. But in this situation, there was nobody in town that had any bolts whatsoever. We're way out in the boonies. So we asked this, we sent this guy on a motorcycle. We said, you need to come back with a hundred inch and a half bolts. Eight hours later, he pulled back up. It was all dark out now, about 10 o'clock at night. He pulls back up in his motorcycle. And he's got these about 10 different bags, little plastic bags with all different sized bolts in there. He said, I bought every bolt in a, in a hundred mile radius of here and brought them back. And we worked with it. We, he had enough in there. We could actually make it work. But those are some of the challenges you face. You don't have ease of access to parts and equipment and wires and breakers and all those standard things. So one of the challenges in doing projects in other parts of the world is that you almost need to over plan. You need to, to have, you know, just have every single thing that you can possibly think of that you might need. You either have to know where you can buy it in that country or ship it with your equipment. And so the planning stage is much more in depth down to every little nut and bolt and wire nut and know exactly what you need to do. It's almost, um, it, it's almost like do you know practicing doing the installation in your mind before you actually go and do it. So the amount of planning and uh, time it takes to get the projects ready is, is tremendous. Most of the projects I've worked on take a two year period to develop. You go and do a feasibility study, you come back, make a budget, you get the funding, you get uh, local organizations with that you feel comfortable working with that can help with the sustainability after you leave. This stuff all takes time. And so two-year project with a one-week installation. So there's a lot of effort that goes in before the project actually happens. How is the decision made as to what system or what projects will be implemented in which communities? How do those uh, how do those get how do those plans get made? How do you know you're giving the community or helping the community with what they need or want? Yeah, so we we will go we will um, make contact with some other nonprofit organization. So we don't work with individuals on these projects. We work with um, you know like school districts or church organizations or other nonprofits that are working in those communities. And so we talk with them and try and identify the needs of that community. And a lot of times um, the community says, well, we've somebody came and drilled a well, but we don't have a pump to pump it out of the well. And so there's a direct, you know, we, we hear about that need and then we can respond to it. We don't really show up uh, in a community and say, well, we have these things that we want you to install on your places. No, it's the, they really, it comes from their desires, and it's pretty much word of mouth. Who's working in, in this country, and what organization would be good to work with? And then we'll start to build a relationship, which is why it takes a while, and you have to have a lot of patience. Uh, Brad, in your experience, uh, it seems to have focused on PV systems for water pumping or lighting, battery charging. Have you had any experience or, um, or witnessed any other renewable energy uh, uses like solar cooking or food drying 
or uh, biogas kind of installations, anything like that that you can talk talked about? Yeah, there's there's more there's more in this world than than PV systems, and I'm a PV guy, so that's what I like to do, and that's where my energy goes. But there's a lot of other things that are going on in the developing world. Most people go and get wood. If they don't have electricity to cook on, they'll go and chop trees down or get firewood and cook with wood. And so we're burning our natural resources, and so we're losing trees rapidly to cook food with. So what are the things I've seen in places? They actually teach people how to make solar ovens out of local materials. So it's not like they're buying a factory-made solar cooker. They're building it right on site, you know, getting the reflectors in the right box out of local wood. And uh, one of the communities I saw work, this was in Nicaragua, with that, where SEI has been working in uh, northern Nicaragua for quite a few years. Uh, they build the solar cookers and they'll let some, they'll give it to some person in the community. And as long as they're using it, that person can have it. But if they go around the community and say, well, you don't even use your solar oven, let's give it to another person. So then they say, okay, we'll give you time. If you want to use it, great. If not, we'll let somebody that's going to use it, use it. And so it's a way to ensure that it gets used. Um, solar ovens, though, take a lot of cultural, there's a lot of cultural issues around cooking. And so to ask someone to switch from what they've been doing for thousands of years and now cooking on this solar oven, it changes the way their lifestyle, their cooking rhythms, their, you know, this takes four or five, six hours to cook with the sun. And so it's, it's, it's a cultural process that has to happen slow. I can't just show up and throw a bunch of solar ovens down and say, hey, you guys are set now.